Hello, everyone, for joining us on the Cloud Native Islamabad live stream. And today we are talking about Container Day. And if you are using the latest version of Kubernetes, there is no option for you and no reason, other, no alternative, and you have to use Container Day. And we talk about a lot of the concept related to Linux containers. And I have a wonderful guest with the, in, on this live stream. And his name is Ivan. I think you know him from his wonderful blog on the internet. Thank you very much, Ivan. So small introduction of yourself to my audience. Um, hello, friends, and uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is uh, Ivan, or Ivan, uh, depends on your continent. And uh, surname is Vilichko, and uh, I am a software engineer. Uh, and it's been a while when I, since I started being a software engineer. But uh, only relatively recently, I fall in love uh, with all these cloud native projects. And I started uh, learning uh, the cloud native stack and uh, the underlying technologies and writing about it. And that's how I found myself um, working in a company that uh, does one of these cloud native projects. And um, now I'm a happy contributor of uh, Docker Slim at Slim AI. Harry, thank you very much for the wonderful uh, for the introduction, and we have a very wonderful audience coming up. Twenty seven people joined uh, as of as of now as seen. And thank you, Nazaka. Thank you, Raghu, Ma, and thank you, Safullah. Thank you, Walid, Mudassir Walid, for joining us. And you can share your questions on the chat. I will add those uh, with the Ivans as we go through. So now I'm just sharing the screen, and Ivan, it's your time to help us learn the kind of technology. Um, okay, uh, and uh, for, for these uh, hypothetical questions, are you going to uh, uh, like read them for me? Because uh, the only thing I, I see now is my screen with my slides. Uh, it's fine, right? Yes, absolutely. I, I, will, I, I, I will continue to monitor the chat, and if I, I have good questions, okay. I will okay. read those and talk about it. Okay, because I feel like I'm not in control of anything here. <laughs> I'm just a presenter. Um, perfect. So today uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Container D. Uh, I, I like to call this project as a secret hero of the cloud native world. And because uh, we all know, you know, Docker and we know we all know Kubernetes, we often interact with these tools, but it's actually hard to find uh, a single container related use case when Container D is not involved under the hood. Uh, but even more, um, Container D is um, uh, such a nice tool that it can be uh, easily integrated into your custom solutions. And there are many projects using Container D um, as they underline a container runtime. And we will see a few examples today. So uh, here is um, what um, we are going to talk about today. And not just talk, I hope uh, it will be pretty hands-on, so I don't want to, to have this workshop as, as some sort of a lecture. No, it's instead of we will try to keep it hands-on and more, more live. So first, um, I would like to go over uh, things that really are needed to create a container. I think for many of us, and for me uh, as well, uh, containers often are kind of related to these docker run command and some other higher level workflows. And these uh, workflows, they kind of um, oversimplify things for us and uh, hide the actual nature of containers. And uh, my somewhat mission is to reveal back this nature to the broader audience, because that's what um, made me MU some time ago. <clears throat> and then when we understand the nature of containers, we will jump to the uh, discussion of different levels of container runtimes uh, and what is even a container runtime and what I would call a container manager, for instance. Um, I'm not sure if there is an official terminology for that, uh, but I find myself uh, it's pretty convenient to see things uh, in this way. 
And then uh, when we understand uh, this hierarchy of container runtimes, we can see what uh, place um, container D itself takes in it and what uh, capabilities it, it uh, exposes and what uh, workloads it uh, allows. And uh, with the understanding of these um, well, capabilities, we can start toying with this API right from the Go code, uh, just to see how simple it is actually to write a container D client or, well, just a generic consumer of container D API. And uh, two more things I would like to touch up on today is, is um, inert, the inert CTL uh, client. It is a, a, a container D C like client that tries to be uh, some sort of Docker compatible uh, it's not really a drop-in replacement, but many of its commands are actually uh, very similar to the ones provided by Docker. So you potentially could replace your Docker uh, command line with a NeuroCTL alias and uh, become a happy user of it. And uh, also we'll see how Container D is actually involved into the Kubernetes um, uh, ecosystem and what role it plays there and how we can leverage the knowledge of container D while uh, learning and uh, debugging or troubleshooting Kubernetes pods. And in the end, uh, we will see uh, what actually uh, impacts this popularity of container D as a tool. So, um, and of course, if you have any questions or some other uh, I don't know, recommendations, uh, feel free to drop a message and I hope Saim uh, would um, uh, read it and uh, we'll all start uh, discussing it. Uh, so uh, what does it really take uh, to create a container? I think uh, like many of us know that uh, and at least heard this um, saying that containers aren't really uh, virtual machines or something like that, uh, and that the containers, they are just Linux processes. It's kind of helpful to some extent uh, until it's not the same. My uh, recent take on this containers thingy is that containers are as much about files as about processes. So we have um, this um, the first realization about containers is that it's a process, but it's an isolated one. And uh, in the end, it's some sort of an isolated execution environment. So to prepare such an environment, we need to have um, some sort of a root file system that would become the new containerized processes uh, file system. And uh, the creation of a container actually starts from preparing this uh, root file system. So for that, we just need to take a folder and drop into this folder a bunch of files. So one uh, set of files is a subfolder containing the future root file system or the container we are going to create. This root file system, it could look like um, a typical Linux uh, distro uh, file system or it could be just a single executable file. If it's, for instance, a statically linked uh, Go binary, both works. Um, and the second file is uh, just a piece of JSON. And this uh, file is uh, normally called uh, config.json and it's uh, a so-called uh, OCI runtime uh, specification. In this file, you would typically find the name and the arguments of the process that we are going to start in this new container. We may have also uh, various um, bits of information like the current working directory or the path to this root file system, which defaults to the rootfs folder. And of course, the set of Linux namespaces that are needs uh, to be used while creating this container and maybe capabilities uh, we will see on the next step. And now the question is, what do we need to do to turn this uh, prepared uh, folder 
into an isolated execution environment called container. Obviously, we need to create this uh, Linux namespaces. We need to start a process. We need to pivot its root to point to this new root file system we just prepared, uh, drop the capabilities and some other things. And we don't really want to do this manually, although it's possible if, if you do this with some uh, shell commands. So there should be a piece of software that would do this for us. And um, probably back then, it was just Docker itself. But over time, this uh, lower level uh, piece of software was extracted into um, a dedicated tool uh, called RunC. RunC is uh, what uh, is it's called a container runtime, but this is um, the lowest level thingy you could just use to uh, create a container. The um, RunC executable is a normal CLI tool. And um, it has a bunch of commands. We will see on the next step uh, on the practical part. So to run a container, you would just supply uh, to the run C create command this uh, bundle we just prepared uh, on the previous step. And of course, you need to give it a name. Um, and once you do this, run C would create all these namespaces, uh, configure uh, C groups, drop capabilities, um, and uh, in the end, you would have this uh, execution environment or a box, if you will. The interesting part on this uh, step is that the process that will be started inside of this execution environment is not really uh, the containerized process we want to run. On this example, it's uh, the sleep process we, we wanted to run in the container. But in actuality, we'll have just some stub process. So to make this uh, stop process, uh, to turn this stop process into the actual containerized process, we need to issue another command, which is run C start. And that command would uh, es essentially exec the sleep process, the process that we wanted uh, to be run inside of this container uh, from this run C init process. But the execution environment stays the same. And uh, the next step probably uh, like in the life cycle of a container would be to stop it or somehow uh, other way signal it. And for that, there is a run C kill command. And uh, if it was a stop signal or just a uh, terminating signal, the container would be stopped. Uh, and um, eventually it um, needs to be deleted. The uh, main part here, uh, and why I uh, wanted to start this workshop from this um, explanation, is that, uh, in my opinion, it's important to understand that containers aren't only about processes. Uh, you see that the actual sleep process, the actual containerized process, was involved only at some steps here. And once we stopped the container and the actual process, the containerized process, process already uh, was gone, the container itself remained because container um, is about the execution environment. It's about this um, isolation borders. It's about uh, files because, for instance, the file system of this container, it will be preserved after the container is stopped. And of course, it's about some metadata that you pass to run C, like this container name or its status. And this understanding that containers are some sort of a structured uh, thingy is important for understanding of the container D API uh, concepts, as we will see uh, further. So now let's try to reproduce this um, uh, exercise and uh, run a container from the command line. So let's see what we have here. Um, I have uh, two boxes prepared. Uh, oh, sorry, not two, just one with two terminal with two terminals. Uh, it's a normal Linux. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's a normal Linux um, box, and um, I think it's Debian. And um, 
uh, there is Docker on it. Uh, but um, the nice part about um, having Docker installed uh, somewhere is that uh, container D and run C will be installed as well. So I have this run C uh, as an executable somewhere in the path. <clears throat> so let's try to create um, a, a first container using just run C and uh, nothing more. Let's call this container um, box one and um, uh, let's uh, create the root file system for this future container. Uh, for the content, uh, we could probably go with um, uh, the file system of Alpine Linux because it's small. And uh, at the same time, it would give us uh, pretty much everything we need. So if we download it from GitHub, so it's not an image. It's um, just uh, a bunch of files. Let's untar it and see what's inside. Oh, I think I finally have memorized it. So it's like that. Was it Alpine and the minus C rootfs. So if now we see what's in this folder, we have um, just the rootfs folder and inside of this rootfs folder there is a future root file system of our container that does look like a Linux distro. So now the next thing to create is this pack. Uh, likely run C has a helper command called spec that produces a file called config.json containing our, our specification. Uh, we don't really need a terminal here. And uh, the default process is uh, a shell, but I would like to just replace it with something simpler. For instance, uh, yes program would do for us. Now, if we close it uh, and um, try to uh, create our container, I'll have to do this as root because uh, rootless containers are possible, but uh, they would complicate this demo. Um, the run C start command, it accepts the bundle uh, path. And in our case, bundle is just the current folder. And the second argument is um, the ID of the container. Well, let's go with just panel full. Okay, we kind of created a container, but nothing really happened. If we try to inspect this container, we will see that uh, it's there, but it's in the state created. And uh, do we have any processes? Well, apparently we do. And we have this stub run C init process, but nothing more. And uh, the next uh, thing uh, to look at is uh, would be the namespaces. And we see that this uh, stub process is an owner of a bunch of namespaces. And these are traditional namespaces used, used for containers. So now let's start this container. And for that, there is a run C start command. And this command accepts just the container ID. And once we started it, it finally started running. And it, uh, as you can see, it hijacked our terminal and started uh, producing a lot of uh, Y symbols to the uh, uh, standard output of the first terminal. And is the right process? Yes, it's there. So the next step it probably would be to kill it. And um, we can use um, uh, the kill signal for that. And now it's gone. And um, that's pretty much it for the container. Um, what probably we could do next is to see uh, a more advanced transi example is uh, an interactive container, a container with an interactive shell uh, running. And for that, we could um, create another bundle. Just give me a second, please.
sorry, it's st stormy in Amsterdam. It always is. So uh, another container. Um, Again, let's uh, pull in Alpine because it's just great for it. And um, oops. Um, and um, another spec. So this time we will keep the terminal on because we are going to use an interactive shell. And we will keep the uh, shell uh, as our process that we want to run inside of our container. And now to speed up things a bit, we, can, we will run it as run C run, which is a, a nice shortcut for the run C start, uh, run C create plus run C start commands. The bundle is again going to be the same uh, folder as we currently in. Um, and uh, the second argument for this command is the container ID. And once we ran it, we um, got an interactive shell. Uh, as you can see, the prompt uh, has changed. But is it Alpine? Yes, it is Alpine. Cool. Apparently, we have a container with uh, an Alpine Linux distro inside and uh, with an interactive shell. Next step, let's see if there is a network stack in this container. Well, apparently there is, uh, but uh, it's not really complete. So what we have here, we have a local host and that's it. While normally you would have uh, um, the public interface of this container to connect it with the outside world. So we got a bunch of questions now. How come we could create a container without images? If you start uh, your container's journey with Docker, you would always see this image everywhere. Like when you run a container, you have Docker run image name. Uh, and uh, when you uh, build a new, uh, when you want to create a new container, you take a Docker file and write there are some commands to build an image. But apparently, we just ran a container or even a few containers without having any images. But we have these bundles, and Run C is clearly not involved in managing bundles; it just consumes them. And who creates these bundle folders? But also. Where are the network interfaces? We just run a container. There is an, a separate network names, namespace, but no network interfaces. So clearly, there is, should be another piece of software concerned with these higher level um, responsibilities. And that's how we are coming to the second part of our workshop, um, where I wanted to talk about different layers of container runtimes. So as we just saw, on the very bottom, there is this run C runtime, which is uh, one of the examples and historically the first one of the OCI compliant container runtime that is concerned with the, the actual container creation. So it prepares this isolated execution environment. It starts the container process. It can signal it. It can clean up after it, but that's it. On the Opposite side of the spectrum, we have Docker or a like, which is, um, well, I think Docker itself, it calls, it, uh, it calls itself uh, a container engine because of the plurality of things it includes. So Docker itself, it not just focused uh, on the container creation, it has a lot of other responsibilities like building new images, authenticating to various registries, or even orchestration. Docker Swarm, at least back then, used to be a thing. Uh, Docker Compose as well. 
So all this uh, functionality, it um, exceeds significantly the functionality of the lower level container runtime like run C. Normally you consume Docker via a Docker D, the daemons API, via the corresponding uh, client uh, we all know and love. This is Docker CLI. But there, is, but there should be something in between this lower level container runtime and the higher level container runtime like, like Docker. Um, because um, there are other use cases that don't really uh, need all this Docker's power. Uh, for instance, when uh, Kubernetes started, probably back in 2014, maybe 15, uh, Docker was uh, kind of the only choice for as a most widespread Kuber uh, container runtime. And uh, Kubernetes started using Docker on its nodes to control containers. However, um, it didn't really need uh, all the functionality of Docker, even back at, uh, at the day. It just needed some subset. And this subset would be, hey, I need to pull an image. I need to start a container. I need to be able to tell the status of this container. I need to be able to terminate this container. And that's pretty much it. No need to rely on Docker, uh, Docker's um, orchestration uh, functionality. No need to rely on uh, other things like building images. Uh, so that actually le led to, the, to a need for creating this, some sort of an intermediate container runtime that would be in control of the lower level control container runtimes like uh, run C, and at the same time wouldn't be overloaded with the higher level functionality uh, like the rest of the Docker's functionality. And that's how we got this container D uh, layer. Container D itself uh, is what I call a container manager. It, uh, its responsibility is to manage containers on a single host. <clears throat> So it has a pretty concise API and uh, it exposes different methods like uh, pull an image, start, a, create a container uh, using a certain image, start a process inside of this container and, and uh, so on and so forth. But all these um, responsibilities of container D, they are scoped to a single host. So there is nothing about orchestrating containers across different hosts. But at the same time, even on a single host, multiple containers, they may need to interact. If you have a, uh, an application container and your database container, you want to uh, be able to call this database container residing on the same host machine from your um, application container. And for that, you probably need to configure networking. And you need to expose the first container and the second container to the host's uh, uh, network stack somehow and then interconnect them. Normally, it's done via a bridge uh, virtual network interface, which is an analog of um, a switch, uh, of a networking switch. And uh, Container D is actually responsible of uh, configuring this stuff. Maybe not directly, maybe via plugins, but this is its responsibility to, a responsibility to coordinate containers on a single host. However, there is another layer, which is also an imp uh, important one is a so-called shim layer. Shim uh, is a, a container shim. It's uh, like a thin, uh, tiny, lightweight process that resides in between the run C runtime or <clears throat> and the actual container manager like container D. And it abstracts the low level details of the runtime from the higher level manager, making it simpler to work with this uh, lower level container runtime on the first uh, on, on one hand and on the other hand uh, taking care of some uh, containers um, uh, like uh, needs like li li life cycle needs like reading container logs and streaming them to a file uh, it's not something a container manager would do because hypothetically a container could do actually outlive a container manager and uh, with this uh, understanding of the place of container D uh, in the whole ecosystem of um, uh, container 
containerization tools, we could probably start um, playing with its capabilities. I would again uh, jump to this um, host with um, uh, Docker installed, and um, uh, we should have um, container D here as well. Okay, here is our container D process. So, how to access container D from a CLI tool? If it's Docker, we normally access it with a Docker uh, CLI tool. And this Docker CLI, it calls Docker D diamond. In case of the container of container D, we have another CLI called uh, CTR. And this CTR CLI is not something that is officially supported by container D. Rather, it's an internal tool used for testing. However, it's pretty handy. We can uh, use it to explore the capabilities of container D. So what a CRI do, uh, CTR does, it uh, calls container D, container D via its socket file that usually is located at uh, run container D, container D sock or something like that. So let's see what we can do with the CTR tool. Here are the commands it has. The first thing, uh, let's take a look at the familiar stuff. Well, apparently it has a subcommand to manage images. It has a subcommand to manage containers. It has a run shortcut. It has but that's pretty much it. The rest is uh, less familiar. For instance, what is a task? Um, and Or what is a namespace? But let's start from something simple. So let's try pulling an image using container D. So it, it's CTR image pool, I guess. And uh, let's go with Alpine. Oops. And we couldn't. And uh, this is actually a great example where a container D um, differentiate itself uh, from the uh, corresponding Docker um, UX. Apparently, uh, one of the uh, Docker's main um, areas of focus is the developer experience. And in Docker, it's uh, super common to have a pull command or even just a run command looking like uh, that, and it works. But actually, this um, Alpine image is not a thing. It's more like um, some sort of a shortcut. And the fully qualified image name, it always includes the container registry, it includes the repository, and it includes a tag. So in the case of container D, it does not have all these heuristics to take a, some sort of a shortcut of an image name and then convert it back into the fully qualified image name. And that's what makes the difference in this um, UX these tools provide. Docker is for is a, like a user-friendly tool, but container D, it, its main um, focus on different uh, on different uh, like areas, and uh, it's just not in its responsibility to provide the most convenient um, way to deal with container uh, D from the command line. So how to pull this uh, with, with the CTR? You need to put a fully qualified image name. And uh, let's see if it works. And it works. Okay, let's see this image. Okay, we have this Alpine image and I already pulled the Nginx image some time ago. Apparently it works. Now let's try to create a container using container uh, D command line client. <clears throat> so for the container, there is um, this um, CTR uh, run command. 
run is somewhat similar to the corresponding um, Docker command. So we can go with minus minus rm to clean up after ourselves. And if you try to run Alpine, uh, we will have to provide the two arguments actually here, not just the image name, but also a container ID. This is another uh, difference. Uh, what would you call it? Um, in the approach, if Docker assigns you an ID, here you are expected to control the process uh, on the more fine-grained level. If you run it, it will again uh, grumble about the wrong image name. So we will have to go with a fully qualified image again. And uh, let's see if it works. Um, OK, it was under next. Uh, never mind. Uh, OK, so apparently running a container uh, with container D is also not that hard. Well, you need to provide the fully qualified image name, and you have to provide the container ID, but it's fine. So what are other things? Like, what is a container D task, for instance? Oops. Apparently, task is more or less the same as a container. But what's the difference? If we remember this um, uh, initial discussion about run C and container not being equal to the containerized process, uh, this should shed some light on this idea of container D's containers and tasks. Apparently, when you create a container uh, in container D, Notice here it wasn't a creation of a container. It was a shortcut command to run it. But if we go and create a container, let's see what happens. So if we do container create, well, let, let it be nginx again. And uh, let's give it an ID. We'll have this nginx container created. Uh, we can see it in the list. But do we have a task? Hmm. No, we don't. Do we have a process? Or run C? Not really. Is there the next? Not really. So creating a container has nothing to do with, with processes in the case of container D. What happened here? Well, apparently it prepared the uh, root file system and this bundle, but it didn't create a container. If you now go and uh, see what other comments are possible for the container, uh, we can see that uh, we cannot really <clears throat> start it, but instead we can start a task. So let's try. And the description of this command actually says start a container that has been created. Yep, and that's how we start container in container D. So this is uh, an important difference of container D and Docker. It's like a manual uh, transmission control. You have to uh, Put, pull, push all the knobs, and you have to control every step of your container lifecycle. And uh, this is great because of, um, uh, well, so this is probably not great if you need, if you need to deal with these containers on the daily basis um, in the command line, doing some higher level uh, stuff. Then it's just tedious and you would just go with Docker. But if you want to work with containers from some other uh, piece of software, or if you want to learn about containers, Container D is a much better uh, place to actually start your journey with containers or to use as a tool uh, to integrate with. Um, so I think this should give you some idea about the capabilities of Container D and its uh, unofficial command line clients, client. And um, just uh, you need to be 
before uh, starting using the CTR client, you need to uh, always remember that it's an official client, no compatibility guarantees, uh, not a full support of uh, Docker's workflow, for instance, things like uh, Docker logs aren't really possible with the, the CTR stuff. You cannot also build things with the container D or CTR. If you want to build an image, you need a fully fledged um, building engine like BuildKit or Docker itself. Um, container D just doesn't allow you to do any builds. And despite container D itself uh, can provide and does provide networking configuration support, you cannot really have many uh, networking related configuration uh, knobs in CTR itself. So CTR is for either some quick um, exploration or for learning, but definitely not for a, uh, like full blown container um, operations. So yeah. let's see what's next. So Ivan, can we can we uh, can we ask add some question here if you of have course. time? Yeah. So of one course. of the question one of the question is I'm a Chaudhary saying like is container D run at runtime or is the daemon running all at all the time? Uh, yes, container D is a daemon. So we have this D on the end of this name of its name, uh, and uh, this should give already us a hint that it's a daemon. Uh, but um, also, if we go back to this uh, diagram, on this diagram, this uh, part is your containerized process. It might be a daemon, might be not, but um, this is like what you control. The run C itself is a command line tool. It's not a daemon. You always just invoke it once, and that's it. The container uh, runtime shim lives as long as your containerized process lives. But container D can live, it can outlive, it's a daemon, it's a long running daemon, and it can outlive some containers. However, some containers can actually outlive container D because of this shim. If container D dies or being restarted because of an update need or something like that, um, it doesn't really matter for the underlying containers because they are controlled by their shim. And when container D restarts, it can uh, pick out the information about the running container from some on-disk location and continue functioning. So container D is a daemon, but it's important to understand that its life cycle is detached from the container life cycle. Yes, thank you very much. And one more question here is developer guy. I, he's a wonderful friend of mine. He's saying, Ivan, can you tell us a lot more about E star GZ images and the support for this in container day? Um, well, I, I, I can tell a, a bit, and I wanted to leave this to the uh, until the end of, of this discussion. Uh, but this is a nice thing to have. So. Um, the idea of container D, uh, and that's actually what makes it so uh, powerful and so popular as an integration tool, is that it's a highly pluggable um, tool. So one of this CTR, uh, one of these commands exposed by CTR is uh, plugins. And if we now try listing the plugins available uh, here, we will see that there are like tens of them probably. And they are of different type. One of the uh, important type of plugins is a Snapshotter plugin. Snapshotter is a fancy name for, the, um, uh, for a subsystem that is responsible, of, uh, that is, that is responsible for uh, creating and mounting these uh, bundles, these root file systems uh, we were um, looking at while playing with run C. And uh, um, there are different ways to mount these 
and to create and mount these root file systems. They could be different because you use various um, file system uh, file system types like uh, BTRFS or uh, overlayFS or some other like ZFS. But they also could be different because of the different mechanism to um, like pull these images and to uh, like optimize on some other level. And this is, I don't really know how this uh, plugin is pronounced, uh, but this StarGZ uh, tool, uh, a plugin, is something that is kind of similar to the idea of Docker Slim itself. So this is a smart uh, way to pull in your images without pulling the full content of an image. Unfortunately, um, modern images, they are often multi-gigabyte big. But the fun fact about this is that only a tiny subsets of their files are uh, like is in use. There was even some research uh, by some institution showing that up to 70 something percent of time for starting our containers, uh, it goes into this image pooling phase. But only six or so percent of files of these images are used. So essentially, we are spending a lot of time to fetch unneeded stuff over the network. Uh, Docker Slim, for instance, it has um, uh, it's one of the way one of the ways to uh, fight with this problem. So what we do at Docker Slim, we take an image, an arbitrary image, we uh, run this image. We call it a target image. We run this target image, but we inject into this image a fancy uh, sensor that does something like ptrace for the underlying containerized process. And while ptracing this process, we are noticing all the file access uh, operations. It could be a read, it could be a write, it could be file creation, deletion, whatever. <clears throat> and from every such an operation, we extract the file path that wasn't uh, mentioned there, and we put it into a report. And then once we traced an uh, image, uh, once we traced the container, we have a report of all files that actually were used. And then we take only those files and create a slim version of the image. And this uh, that could be then used as a complete replacement of your original image. And normally, not normally, but like often, it's um, like something like 10% of your original size, or I don't know, even 5%. Of course, it could be 80%, but still it's in a reduction. And this uh, start GZ to uh, this plugin, this container D plugins, it has a similar um, idea, but implemented at a different stage. If Docker Slim does this uh, kind of offbound, <clears throat> maybe at your CI, um, start GZ uh, plugin, it does it um, uh, as part of your main container workflow. So it has. Um, similar idea of tracing images and analyzing what files are used. And then while pulling this image, it would pull only the needed files. Unfortunately, the, uh, like the original images aren't suitable for that because you need to have this um, uh, like positioning information, like at what uh, quote unquote offset inside of an image start fetching stuff and at what st to stop doing this. But if you did this uh, pre like this um, analyzing phase <clears throat> of bound before that, you could actually kind of seamlessly replace um, your normal images with this uh, pre-analyzed uh, StarGZ images and uh, re significantly reduce time for pooling images. Um, yeah, that's uh, the idea. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think it's a topic of its own. It's need another workshop, e -Star GZ plugin, because there's so many things in it. Yeah, and, yeah. and one more question, like Cassandra is saying, Containerd is only suitable for automated, automated mechanism acting as a low level, because primarily we have Docker engine on high levels. What's more productive Containerd provides? 
uh, more productive. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, there are different um, ways to see uh, how this could be, uh, how, how container D is, is, could be even more useful than Docker, for instance. If you want to uh, write a piece of software that integrates with uh, a container runtime, doing this um, with uh, Docker itself might be too complicated. It has like two, um, uh, it, it just gives you fewer uh, knobs to control your containers. While uh, with the container D, you have more knobs and you have uh, better control. And at the same time, the API is simple. Uh, so this is what makes uh, it more productive if you are writing a piece of software that needs to start containers you would probably go with container D and start starting containers using container D uh, directly, then integrating with Docker itself. But if you want uh, a container runtime for your um, like semi-manual use that would you be using from your command line, then what you probably need here is a more advanced client. And we will see how NerdCTL is another container D client can be used with container D to make uh, its UX almost as close uh, as uh, like almost as high as high level as uh, the Docker's itself um, functionality. So uh, and at the same time you don't have a dependency on Docker then. Uh, like there are different um, uh, there are many different motivations why you may not want to have Docker on your machine or in your company um, and with this with the help of this advanced clients backed by container d you can actually achieve this goal yes absolutely and i think the one thing we have to think about like kubernetes is moving the support for the docker and for the docker you don't need for the kubernetes you not need to have a ui ux it's actually need a container management life cycle for the orchestration engines like Kubernetes, you need more use of the container day because it's pulling the images and these kind of stuff. For the Docker, it's a complete management life cycle for the pulling the images and making the images have build kit support, build exports. So for the Kubernetes, it's not a human, it's actually a orchestration engine. So you need a good container day to support that. So that's all the question we have, and now it's time to go on. Okay, uh, so uh, that actually was a, a great question, uh, like how how you could um, be more productive with container D, and let's see how we can actually write a program that would use container D um, as as a container runtime. So uh, the, these were uh, like this is just a combination of uh, container D, the underlying low level container runtime and different possible um, consumers of container D. <clears throat> so uh, let's write a program. It, it, it's been a while <laughs> uh, since we were writing any code in this workshop. So let's uh, write a tiny program. Uh, so the, the program, it will be just um, accessing container D from uh, the Golang uh, code, and we will try to build some sort of a command line client because, as we just saw, the CTR is too low level. It it, it, it uh, requires you to do too many I don't know, moves. So let's try to build a replacement because we are programmers. Let's call it my CTR, and um, <clears throat> we need to. We need a new module, and the, I think it's like that. So it's a container D uh, uh, client, so we will need to import container D and leave the container D, container D like that. So it leaves uh, it leaves on GitHub. And uh, the initialization is like super simple. 
we will be accessing this um, container the API via its uh, socket file, and the socket file it leaves at uh, uh, at the run container d container d dot sock low, uh, path, and the client creation in the case of container d is uh, super simple. So we just need to essentially hit uh, container d new, and that's pretty much it. Oops. Of course, we will have to do the error handling because uh, otherwise we will not be able to tell if it's failing silently. And since it's a new client, we will have to close it um, uh, once we are done. Uh, this is just a good idea. And let's print out something. Print and create it. Okay, let's give it a shot. ICTR. Oh, of course, we're, we need to pull in the packages and let's try to build it again. Okay, we got uh, the very basic container D client. You can now run it. And I, I had to use uh, sudo because this um, container uh, run container D sock file is uh, owned by root. Yep, seems like it works. So if we, if we review it, um, like nothing complicated, we essentially just created a, a client. Okay, so what next? Uh, we probably should try um, pulling an image. Um, pulling an image is, is a long um, operation, so it's probably a good idea to use the context for that, uh, that you would be able to cancel up some timeout, I don't know, but in our case, we'll just simplify it to the background uh, context. Again, uh, what I like about container D is its simplicity. So pulling an image is just as simple as uh, calling container D pool, and that's it. Uh, of course, we, are, we will need to provide the image name, so it's um, the fully qualified one again. Um, I think it's library, library, and let's go with Alpine again. Alpine. And uh, one last thing here uh, to provide is the is a flag, and this flag it says um, it says please unpack this image once you pulled in uh, because we are going to use it actually. <clears throat> So this method, it returns us an image and um, the second uh, value is, is always uh, the error. So let's quickly do the error handling. We actually cannot do much in the case of an error here. And uh, let's print out what we actually got. Image pulled. And uh, the name of this image. So just a few lines. I just love line breaking, but essentially it's one line. So kind of one, two lines, and you can pull an image. Let's build it. And uh, yeah, what's up? Yeah, of course, it's not container D, it's client. We have to use the client uh, to pull an image. Let's build it and let's uh, run it one more time uh, and see if it works. And it doesn't. Uh, but this is uh, an expected error because one of the things we uh, haven't covered while uh, looking at this CTR uh, tool was uh, the namespaces subcommand. Apparently, container D is pretty serious about these namespaces. And um, not to be confused with Kubernetes namespace, namespaces, but um, the idea is kind of similar. It's for isolation. So what does it mean? It means that container D, uh, by design, supports multi-tenancy. You can have different uh, consumers, different uh, programs, 
living on the same host and consuming just one instance of container D and at the same time not infer interfering with each other like at all. So if, if one um, consumer of container D uh, pulls, let's say, an Nginx image and another one pulls an Nginx image and you don't want these images be the same because, well, I don't know, of, of reasons, it could be, for instance, regulations or uh, you want to actually pull this image and then mess up with it and you don't want to break it for other um, consumers, you can use namespaces. So namespace is essentially uh, just, um, well, you can think of it as, as, a, as, of, as, a, as of a subfolder on disk where the images for this particular uh, tenant would be stored and con containers metadata would be stored also under the same root. And then for another tenant, you would have another subfolder. And uh, let's see uh, what namespaces we have here. So we have the default one. We have Mobi, and uh, this is uh, Docker's uh, namespace um, because we have Docker running on the same host. And we have some other created by me some time ago. So let's try to fix our program and uh, start using namespaces. Um, and to provide a namespace information to container D, we actually need to bake it in into the context. So it's gonna be like that with a namespace. And for the namespace, let's go with uh, my namespace two. So now, if we if we rebuild this uh, command and try to run it again, hopefully we will pull in the image. Uh, again, I'm always forgetting to put a tag, so the container D cannot even get a tag for us. And we just pulled in Alpine. And OK, that's great. So what, what's next? Uh, we have an image. We can communicate with container D API. Let's try creating a container. So to create a container, uh, well, first let's uh, refactor this program a bit. And let's extract this image pooling uh, functionality into a subroutine. Uh, well, let's call it pool image, name is heart, but in this case, context, uh, context, um, we need to pass in the container D client, so it's container D client, I guess, um, and I think it's a point direction, and we need to pass in the image name, which is a string, and um, I think we are going to return an image uh, because we will have to use it from the outside. And the body will be just that. Yep, and this should become an image name. Okay, that's... Um, the first subroutine, and let's do real, really simple arguments, uh, command line arguments handling. So if we got a first argument equal to the uh, pool string, then we will do the pool image uh, magic. And the image name will be just a second uh, argument. But if the argument is, uh, so it's not argue, args, arg, it just args, yes. And But if the argument is um, run, then we will do another thing. Uh, oops, not run. We will not be doing really a run. We will do a start here. <clears throat> so instead, oops, not start. I'm sorry. We will do a create. 
uh, we'll do create container uh, subroutine, create container. And uh, this subroutine, it will also accept the image uh, name. It will do slightly different thing inside. Um, but just to show you that creating a container is not much um, more complicated task than pulling an image. First, we will need to pull an image. And uh, there is some caching, so no hard feelings if we do this uh, multiple times for the same image. Uh, client and image name. And uh, once we got an image, we need to essentially just do uh, client container uh, method, uh, new container. And um, it will return us a container object and an error as, as always. Uh, and of course it accepts the CTX, but uh, these arguments, it will, has, it will have to take something in uh, and this thing is an ID and some options. So for the ID, we can just generate one using some UUID because we are lazy. We will use a package for that. Uh, and let's generate an ID. What was it new, I think? Um, and let's, let's pass it in. But for the options, uh, to create a container, uh, normally, we will have to know the image name and we will have to know the uh, specification, this uh, config uh, spec file that uh, we were creating manually while playing with run C. So to create um, an image, um, oh, sorry, not an image. So it's a container uh, that is um, being started by this run C uh, thingy. So it doesn't really need an image. It needs a bundle. And a bundle is just a normal folder. So we need to make this folder. As we already know, after the StarGZ discussion, in container D, uh, these folders are being created. These rootfs folders are being created by these snapshotters. So we will have to uh, create a snapshot uh, for this uh, container. Uh, but um, what from? From the content of our image. So. That's actually what will then create this bundle fol folder for us. Not bundle fol folder, but the root FS sub uh, subfolder of this folder. And the second part of this bundle folder is uh, the, um, uh, the specification. And the specification that includes, uh, as you probably remember, the um, process name, the user, uh, the, user uh, the namespaces, and usually this stuff is a part of your image metadata. So we also need to provide an image here. Uh, because we can override some of this, but the default will come from the image. Um, and for that, we will have to just tell it uh, that we will, um, let's include this OCI package. That we will take this from the uh, image object. And what was it? Image config. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. So now the only thing uh, that is left is uh, error handling. And uh, let's try to print out whatever we got here. It is container. Um, yeah, let's try to build it. Line 39. Okay, ICTR pool 
Petraio library uh, HTTPD. Latest. I will not forget about the tag this time. Okay, we just pulled in something. And if we try to create a container, well, apparently we just created a container. So let's review it quickly. What does it take to create a container with container D client? Again, just a few lines of code. Essentially, you invoke this new container uh, method, and then you supply the snapshot, in this case, created from an image, and the uh, OCI specification. OK, next, next thing um, we could do with container D is probably uh, listing the available containers or uh, signaling containers or starting containers since we just created the container. But the idea is simple. We just um, uh, keep using this API, and uh, it's uh, pretty uh, self-explanatory. We could jump to this uh, API and read uh, all these methods. And this actually um, makes container D uh, popular, it's a, pop a popular choice for various integrations. One of the uh, one of my favorite examples of um, a container D users is uh, FASD daemon. Uh, so it's a part of the OpenFAST project, and the OpenFAST project uh, is um, uh, a FAST solution, somewhat similar to AWS Lambda offering. Uh, but um, not exactly the same. So it, it has a slightly different model, but essentially it's a function as a service. Uh, FAST, the OpenFAST itself, uh, its primary uh, runtime platform is Kubernetes. So you just spin up things on Kubernetes and um, you spin up the orchestrator or, or the FAST, OpenFAST, uh, or, not or orchestrator, but like manager. And it works there, and it, it uh, spins up, up functions for you and uh, handles the life cycle. But if you don't want to go with Kubernetes, or, or your use case is smaller, and you are just fine with having one or two virtual machines with something simpler, but you still want to benefit from a function as a service kind of capabilities, you can use FASD which is a lightweight um, alternative uh, that is conformant to the OpenFAS um, API. And in the case of FASD, um, the uh, architecture is super simple. You have a single uh, virtual machine. And on this virtual machine, you have a container D running. And the container D is responsible of uh, managing containers that run uh, these functions. So as simple as just that. And there is just system D, and the system D controls container D lifecycle. So whenever this machine boots up, um, the container D is, is started. And if it dies for, for some reason, continue, uh, system D would just ensure that it's been restarted. But who consumes container D? Um, well, there is this fast D daemon, another daemon that um, is a consumer of container D. And if we go to the uh, code base of this FASD, we will see that oops, uh, that it uses um, pretty much the same API in a, in a very similar way that we just used in our tiny uh, MyCTR program. So let's take a quick look. <clears throat> this is uh, FASD's code base. And this is a, a command, so it's an entry point, and a command called provider. And uh, somewhere here, we would have this. Oh, actually, let's uh, go from the import. Yep. So, pretty much the same code. We are creating a client, and this client uh, is used then by various handlers that do some uh, function related stuff like deploying a new function or uh, deleting a function or scaling up or down a function and so on and so forth. And just as an example, we can take a look at the uh, deploy handler and see how this client 
you see it's passed here, how this client is used here. So if, if we take a look at it, um, well, some, <clears throat> uh, some uh, playing with the namespaces, probably also the tenancy is uh, leveraged by uh, FASD. And here is how uh, a container is created. So very similar to the approach we just followed ourselves. We use a client, we uh, create a new container, we pass in some arguments. If you want to have knobs, you have them, you can uh, configure some capabilities, you can configure a host name, mount points, whatever. Uh, but at the same time, just like 10 lines of code and you have what you need. So that it's uh, uh, pretty much it for the uh, API usage example. But this uh, simplicity of the API usage, it brings us to the probably obvious thought. If it's so simple to use ContainerD uh, API, then there are probably should be like plenty of command line clients using this because well, people love to experiment with container stills. And there is, uh, and that would be my next um, topic to present. I wanted to uh, show how NerdCTL uh, can be used uh, to provide some sort of a Docker-like um, experience. Uh, but first, uh, are there any questions about using ContainerD from Go? Ivan, I see a one good question from the Valid. Can we look into the processes inside container with Golang packages? Yes, this uh, is uh, done with uh, the notion of a task. So container um, is um, about metadata, at least in the uh, container D uh, parlance. So when you create a container, like in our example here, um, we actually created, uh, well, some sort of a metadata record. But to start a process in this container, we need to create a task. So for that, uh, we, will have, we will use another method, like uh, client, um, client new task, I think, um, or something like that. Um, let me... Let me see. Oh, maybe it's not directly, but through a task service. Um, yeah, it's through a task service, and you have to invoke uh, like create, start, and things like that. Through uh, so through this uh, this service, you can uh, have um, a more granular control over processes inside of your containers. So the most obvious example is to start the main containerized process. But you also have other use cases, like executing another command inside of a running uh, container. And for that, you have uh, an exact method. Um, yep, does it answer your question, or it's? Um... Yes, it's answer to me. And Valid, if you have, if we are clear for you, answer, uh, have understand this, go ahead. And if you have more questions, you can add it. So go ahead, Valid. And yes, go ahead. Okay, so then let's take a look at this NerdCTL thingy because it's a really, it's a really nice tool, and uh, I uh, love it and uh, use it pretty often. <clears throat> so for NerdCTL, um, I would actually switch the gears uh, and jump to oops, the wrong uh, terminal. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and, and jump to uh, another playground because um, this machine we were experimenting on, uh, it's kind of spoiled by all these experiments and it, have, uh, it has um, like a full-fledged Docker in installation and uh, uh, NerdCTL would just work. And I don't want it to work out of the box. And so I wanted to show you how you can actually fix some issues with it. Uh, by just combining various building blocks uh, from this cloud-native um, realm 
uh, much like you would do in Lego, because it's so cool that when everything is interoperable. So let's go to, to yeah, where, where is my browser? Let's go to this um, uh, Kubernetes playground on Killer Coda. Um, like nothing fancy here, just um, another another terminal uh, that gives us uh, SSH-like access to a node. Like there is, I think, a Kubernetes on this node, but there is clearly no NerdCTL installed. Uh, but I think there is container D as well, because modern, probably most of the modern Kubernetes installations, uh, they would go with container D. <clears throat> so do we have container D here? Container D. Yay, we do. So this one. OK, um, so how can we install uh, NerdCTL? It lives on GitHub under container D uh, organization. And uh, installing uh, NerdCTL is as simple as just um, downloading it from the releases page. But um, other methods also support it, like uh, doing it with brew or something. Let's just copy this. Uh, from here. Okay, so we just pulled in uh, NerdCTL and let's untar it. Okay, it seems like we got a working binary. So let's uh, move it to some NerdCTL. What? Yeah, it works. Um, so, as I promised, this tool provides um, uh, very close to Docker uh, UX. So let's try uh, the favorite Docker uh, command, uh, Alpine. Alpine. Yep, and it kind of works. So uh, until it doesn't. Um, again, you just have one run and a, an image shortcut and it works, uh, but it doesn't use Docker on anything. It just goes directly to, um, to the container D's uh, API because NerdCTL is just yet another client consumer nerd, uh, container D uh, API. So, but starting our container failed. And the error message uh, says that it's something, uh, it has something to do with networking. Uh, it mentions bridge, uh, it mentions CNI, which is a container networking interface plugin. Uh, so apparently there is, no, um, there is no tool to configure networking for our Alpine container. So what we can do, uh, how can we fix it? Well, first of all, we can uh, <clears throat> try fixing it by avoiding using the bridge network, like at all. So for that, we can go with a network host and see if it helps. Well, apparently it does. Uh, is it even Alpine? Yes, it is Alpine. But if you look at the interfaces, well, it says uh, it's pretty much what you have on host. And if you don't want to use the host uh, networking uh, stack, which is not, might be not I don't know, secure in your case, uh, you could try fixing it by really installing this uh, CNI plugin. And the cool thing about these plugins, and ContainerD also uses them, is that they are just uh, plain uh, binaries, uh, normally statically linked, so you can just download them. Again, I'm downloading them from the releases page of the corresponding uh, GitHub project. So if I now untar them, um, uh, 
uh, CNI minus C. What was it? Libxar, libxz, I think. CNI or something like that. And uh, if we take a look at this file that we just, uh, at the, well, we unpacked a whole bunch of files, but if we take a look at the, um, at the bridge plugin, CNI bridge, yeah, we will see that it's indeed just a normal executable file. So it's like a CLI tool. Um, and that's uh, the beauty of the CNI plugins. They are just uh, simple to use. So let's see if it actually fixes our um, Alpine example. If we remove the network, uh, the host network, and try running it again, we see that we have a normal uh, single typical container setup when we have just a one interface with a dedicated IP address. So CNI plugins are simple. Go use them in your tools. Um, okay, what else could be done with this NerdCTL tool? Uh, one of the limitations of uh, CTR was that we cannot really uh, do even port forwarding, like even basic stuff. With NerdCTL, we can uh, have pretty much what uh, Docker uh, has. So if we try exposing a port of an Nginx, for instance, container, uh, and see if it works, uh, that should give us pretty much uh, identical experience. Another useful command is uh, PS, the same command you would use with uh, Docker. So, yeah, we just got um, an Nginx container running with a minus P flag and um, exposed its port 80 on, on the host. So, um, we can, of course, stop this container. So, uh, I mean, the UX of uh, NerdCTL is very similar to, to the one Docker provides. Um, including this uh, lovely thing of having just partial IDs. So I just uh, stopped the container using um, its uh, two letters of its ID. Another nice thing about NerdCTL is that it's aware of these namespaces. So we are on a host that has a Kubernetes running. Uh, we have kubectl here, uh, and we can show that we have some services running on this node. But we know that, contain, uh, that uh, Kubernetes, it uses um, probably uh, some container D integration to run these pods. Uh, but if you run an RCTL PS, it doesn't show us anything. But we know that there are some pods running uh, on this node. So how can we see them? For that, we need to uh, see namespaces provided, uh, in, uh, available on this, um, uh, on this host. OK. Is it namespace? That's just namespace. And we have here a dedicated Kubernetes namespace. Again, not to be confused, confused with the namespace you have inside of your cluster. This namespace used, uh, I mean, the cluster's namespace used for uh, isolating your Kubernetes uh, objects uh, from each other. But this namespace uh, is a container D namespace. So if you now try listing images, for instance, um, that live on this box under this uh, uh, Kubernetes namespace, we will see that there is actually plenty of them. And at the same time, um, under the default namespace, there is only my images. So on one hand, this shows this uh, wonderful multi-tenancy of container D. On another hand, it shows you how to debug Kubernetes-related issues if you uh, have access to Kubernetes nodes. So if, if you feel like you have some issues with pods or containers or, I don't know, something um, like container-related on a Kubernetes node, you can jump there and start playing with the CTR. Uh, but if you feel like it's too limiting and you cannot really, uh, I don't know, tap into these containers using CTR, 
you can quickly install, install uh, NerdCTL by downloading it from the releases pages, for instance, and then go with this um, Kubernetes namespace and listen all the containers there. And these are the containers constituting your pods. So what you can do now, you can just uh, take any of them and uh, uh, executive it. And uh, maybe you will be lucky enough and batch will be there. Oh, like in this case, I just executed into one of the Kubernetes containers. Uh, but it doesn't have PS, which is fine. <clears throat> yep. Um, another cool trick with the Nerd CTL is, um, um, is this um, build, it, it's building capabilities. So um, Nerd CTL, it depends uh, for most of its use cases directly on container D. But as we already know, uh, container D does not have any image building capabilities. So if we want to build an image using CTR, we won't be really able to undo this. However, NerdCTL can allow you building images. So if we, if you look for the NerdCTL uh, build uh, subcommand, it does have it. So we can go with help. However, invoking it uh, clearly fails. And it fails with a message uh, saying that uh, build kit is unavailable. So NerdCTL can build your images as well, but instead of integration with container D, it uses another integration with build kit, uh, and it's Divan. And if it happens um, that you have a node, a Kubernetes node, I mean, this normally happens during development. If you have a Kubernetes node and you have um, a nerd CTL and uh, build kit available there. What you can do, you can uh, use this uh, trick to build an image that then will be available directly on this node. Uh, this is not something you would probably do in production, but during development of some experimentation, it's pretty helpful. So you do this nerd CTL um, build command, but with a namespace. And then, as always, you have a tag and you need to provide the Docker file from some path. And if you have build kit, it would uh, succeed and you would have this image directly available on the node. So neat, I, I, I personally abuse it a lot. Um, another cool trick with NerdCTL, also not something you would probably use in production, but you may use it to play with containers even, um, even further. NerdCTL allows you to run um, containers without images. So instead, you could supply a root file system uh, for the, uh, to the run command. And um, what we can do now, we can uh, get back to the CTR. CTR is also present on this box because container D is here. And prepare a, a root file system. And this could be done uh, with another cool CTR command uh, called mount. So let's see if we could uh, pull uh, an image and then mount it to a folder. Uh, CTR image pull Docker library Alpine latest. Okay, we just pulled in Alpine. And what we can do now, let's create a folder. And what we can do now, we can go and uh, mount this image. This is another cool trick of CTR you can use to explore your images. So, and let's write it, let's mount it um, in writable way and let's uh, mount it to the root file system folder. So now, if you look at this root file system folder, we will have this Alpine uh, file system there. And combining this uh, trick with a uh, nerdctl run uh, minus minus root file system, um, we uh, should probably be able to actually start um, a shell. What was it? Uh, oops. file system. We should be able to start the shell. No. Mm, 
Oh, okay. Maybe IT should be here. Nope. Okay, help. No, it's root file system, should be fine. Okay, so I, I messed up with this commands. Hey, no, please, what happened to you? Okay, did our environment just die? I don't really want to redo this. We have another tab. Phew. Uh, okay, so let's try again. Run. Root file system. Uh, the root file system is equal to the to this uh, folder. And that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, one of the command is saying, like Packer is saying, push, put sh at the end. That might solve the issue. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, I mean, it should be fine. Um, yeah, well, that's bizarre. Um, Yes, what was it? No. For some reason, it wants to have, I. Uh, it doesn't like the order of these um, flags. Okay, <laughs> that's funny. For some reason, it, it wanted to have a IT before a root file system. Okay, anyway, we just um, started um, a shell as a containerized process without having any image, but using the contents of this um, uh, folder as its root file system. And what we have here is more or less functional Alpine container. Yep. And even with networking. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it for NerdCTL. Um, but NerdCTL, uh, itself is useful, but the most uh, of it you can get uh, by having it combined with another project called Lima. Uh, Lima is an attempt, is yet another attempt to uh, popularize the container D. Um, and Lima, well, you can think of it as of a virtual machine with the container D and NerdCTL running inside and then an ability to run this virtual machine efficiently on macOS. I, I'm a frequent Vagrant user and I run a lot of things there, but it's VirtualBox. And VirtualBox not always, uh, not, 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 not always, but like you cannot use VirtualBox on an ARM machine. Uh, it's only Intel or AMD. And uh, with Lima, you can finally have something similar uh, to this VirtualBox experience, but on an ARM machine, uh, like on this M1 laptop. And um, the only thing you would need to do is uh, just like brew, install Lima. I won't be doing this right now because it would take uh, too much time. I did it already before. And the next thing you do is uh, Lima start. No, oh, sorry, Lima CTL start. And it would spin up you a new uh, machine. And this is a, a camel machine. And uh, uh, since it's emulation, you can have uh, Intel on ARM and or ARM on Intel. Um, of course, it, could be it would be slower. But most of the time, you would want to have a one-to-one, -one, like you would be running Intel on Intel uh, containers. Uh, but the, uh, that's not the point here. The point is that you will have container D inside. And uh, this is another example how container D could be used as a tool to integrate with easily. So now we have uh, Lima running. Uh, oh, by the way, it's, um, it's a macOS. 
uh, it's my old uh, MVP. And we have um, Lima installed and running here. And now we can have this uh, Lima nerd CTL uh, run uh, minus D minus P80 and the next. And um, I won't have this Nginx running on this uh, macOS directly. It will be inside of um, a virtual machine. But at the same time, as you just saw, I, um, oh, okay, I didn't like the port uh, number. I just tried exposing a port. And if we curl now this uh, localhost 8089, hooray, we just got a container and the behavior very similar to Docker desktop on macOS without actually having Docker desktop and um, uh, without having this Nginx running directly on uh, macOS. So that sounds like a big win to me. Uh, if you uh, want to have isolated execution environment on your macOS, you can do this now with Lima and NerdCTL. And if you are already a savvy user of NerdCTL, the only thing you need to learn is to prefix it with the Lima uh, keyword, and that's it. And also, I think there is a, an alias like NerdCTL Lima or something. It gives you pretty much the same. Um, and uh, let's take a look uh, inside my favorite uh, activity. <laughs> so if we have this Lima CTL, I think it's list. Yeah, it uh, shows you what virtual machines are running right now. And if you go with Lima CTL shell and the name of this virtual machine, it will let us in. So now we are actually on a machine. It's not. Um, it's not a macOS anymore, it's a Linux. And uh, here we have, what, what do we have here? And here we have, um, um, we have here, um, container D, yeah. Here we have container D running in the rootless mode, which is cool. Um, we have build kit running to allow building our images. So that's in addition to container D itself. The cool part, we have star GZ running. So apparently at least some of the image pooling uh, will be faster uh, with a Lima. <clears throat> and we have uh, our Nginx container running here under control of this RunC uh, plugin, of this RunC issue. So that's what uh, Lima does. Um, yeah, I think um, we are almost ready to tackle the final uh, part of this uh, practical uh, workshop um, is um, Kubernetes uh, and container D. Um, any questions about NerdCTL, Lima, and stuff like that? Yes, I don't see in the chat question on that, but I see the news today around the Lima. Is Lima is, is I think, project maintained by the Akiru Soda, and he's now going for the incubation part of the CNCF. So that's a bad, good news for everyone, because in the Mac, we need a machine, like we're using an M1 chip, especially like me. So you need this kind of thing. It's, container is already available. So that's a wonderful demo is going up. So we go ahead. And when I see questions, I will ask those. Yep, cool. And uh, yeah, this is very good news, actually, because it, it shows the maturity of the projects, of the project. Because there are lots of cool projects, but they are often like, you know, they, they come and go. Uh, uh, and uh, when something goes to CNCF, it means it will stick for a while, and that's great. It means you can start investing into learning it, and it will not be a wasted skill. OK, uh, last but not least, uh, Container D and Kubernetes. Um, on Kubernetes, um, on a cluster node, <clears throat> we have this uh, agent running. It's Kubelet. 
so this agent it controls uh, the node and it um, in particular res is responsible uh, for starting containers. However, uh, Kubelet does not start containers uh, directly. It relies on a container runtime, which is most of the time is container D. Uh, I think most of the major uh, cloud providers like Amazon and uh, uh, Google and Azure, all of them use container D in fresh Kubernetes um, clusters. Uh, but there are some alternatives to this runtime. For instance, uh, Red Hat products, they tend to use uh, Cryo as a similar container runtime. But how does a Kubelet actually um, communicate with this container runtime? Back in the day, when uh, instead of this container D runtime, Kubelet was um, running um, with Docker on the same node, it used to have some kind of dirty implementation of this um, interconnection called uh, Docker shim. Uh, but then uh, when the need uh, for this um, uh, container, uh, for this more lightweight container uh, runtime was satisfied and container D appeared, um, like people started thinking of uh, standardizing this um, interface in between kubelet and the container runtime. And that's how this container runtime interface or CRI um, appeared. So CRI is um, some sort of an alternative API exposed by uh, the container D daemon. It's also a gRPC API, but it's slightly different from the container D's uh, primary API. So this um, CRI, uh, it's um, a pod aware API Behind container D, <clears throat> the picture behind container D or like below container D is very similar uh, in the case of a Kubernetes node. We have um, pods running um, and every pod uh, consists of uh, multiple containers with one of them being mandatory is uh, a so-called uh, pose container that is an owner of the pods sandbox. Um, and we have um, a, a shim process that controls in the case of I think of modern um, uh, container D uh, versions uh, this uh, shim is just one per uh, whole pod so one shim controls multiple containers but in the case of a pod life cycles uh, of these containers are more or less synchronized so now let's see if we can um, how can we consume this um, how can we consume this uh, CRI, uh, CRI API of container D? Um, it's kind of handy that we are on uh, a Kubernetes playground. So let's see, and do we have other nodes? Because I think we are on the, um, on the master node here, but we have a worker node. So let's try um, searching this environment to this other node. And let's see how can we actually play with container D as a CRI implementation. So what, what do we have here? <clears throat> we have um, uh, some Calico pods running as a pod uh, controlled by this shim. We have uh, kube proxy running as a pod controlled by this shim. We have kubelet running here. Well, that's great. Uh, and we have container D running. Interesting that we also have Docker for some reason running on this node, but I'm pretty sure it's not used and the container D is used. Uh, we can actually see this probably from the get nodes output uh, on the master node, but anyway, so how to consume the CRI API of container D. For that, there is another tool, not CTR anymore, um, but um, a CRI CTL tool. This tool is not by container D. Uh, this tool is by uh, like Kubernetes um, folks. And this tool is a standard tool to consume any CRI compliant API. In particular, container D is one. 
Cryo, for instance, could also be uh, explored using this tool. The difference, the main difference of uh, Container D's uh, CRI API and the Container D um, default or standard API is that the CRI API is pod, uh, is focused on the on pods. So you have pod as first class citizens there, and you can start. Um, because otherwise, like, what is a pod? Essentially, pod is um, um, is a group of I don't know semi-fused containers. If a container is a box uh, that is, um, that is shaped by multiple namespaces, like you have this uh, PID namespace for uh, process isolation, you have the net namespace for a uh, dedicated network stack, you have a mount namespace, uh, UTS namespace, and so on. In the case of a pod, you have a like, somewhat similar um, picture, but not exactly the same. For instance, in the case of a pod, all the containers in a pod, they should share one network stack because they uh, it's handy for them to be able to communicate over the shared local host. And that's why all the container pods, they live in the shared network namespace. Also, all the uh, containers in the pod, they should be able to communicate via the standard uh, IPC tools like uh, various queues. But at the same time, every pod has a unique file system. So every container in a pod has a dedicated mount namespace. And by default, every container has its own process tree. So the PID namespace is also dedicated for a pod. Um, and now imagine you would need to create such a pod as a group of semi-fused containers using uh, Docker uh, or like container D native API. Technically it's possible because one, while you are creating a container, you normally can uh, specify which namespaces to use and not just to create new namespaces. So if you already have a namespace on your system, you can tell container D or Docker to reuse this particular namespace for a given container. But it's kind of tedious uh, from, the Kubernetes, from the Kubeless standpoint. Like imagine you would need to create uh, a pod and for that you would need to issue a bunch of requests to the underlying um, container runtime API asking it to uh, do multiple things how would you even clean up in this case? Like imagine you asked this um, CRI, uh, you ask this con container runtime to create your first container, and then it, um, it succeeded. Then you ask to create the second one and it fails for some reason. You would need to go back and, and reverse the previous change. And that would of course complicate the code of the kubelet uh, and would teach us things that are not, aren't really in its, in its primary responsibility. So for that, uh, this, CRI, oops, this CRI API was introduced. And uh, um, if we take a look at this CRI CTL tool, uh, the, uh, it should give us a hint what methods are available there. Some of them are already familiar, like uh, PS, for instance, is to list the containers. But some other methods are new, like um, pods, uh, to list pods. So let's see what's the difference. Like we have, um, actually, uh, let's uh, create maybe uh, a new pod just to be able to explore something. I had somewhere this piece of YAML uh, to create a very simple <coughs> pod. Uh, nothing fancy here, just a pod with two containers. One is a primary one with a HTTP server, and another one is just a sidecar doing nothing. Um, oh, we have to do this from the, uh, the master node. Okay, so let's take a look at the pods. Oops. When I see kubectl, I always <laughs> default and get. Um, yeah, these are the pods running on this worker node. And this is ours. And you see, we just have uh, the kube proxy one, 
the DNS one, our own, and some other plumbing. Just four of them. But if we take a look at the containers, we have more. For instance, instead of our pod, we have two containers here. Uh, but actually, if you now uh, apply uh, the previous trick from this um, CTR um, tool, we can uh, look and see what other containers are here that aren't really listed by the CRCTL tool. Uh, so what was it? Uh, um, uh, there is a shortcut. And we need to use the namespace. And actually, we have more containers. And uh, these other containers, um, looking at their images, they are these post containers. And post containers are actually uh, somewhat owners of these pod uh, namespaces, or of these pod sandboxes. So if we look at the namespaces here, we will see that most of them are owned by this pose uh, container thingy. However, some other are not. So this um, sleep container is uh, our sidecar. It resides in two dedicated namespaces, mount and PID. So it has a dedicated file system and it has a separated process tree. But at the same time, and I think same should be for, the, for our Python, uh, which is our application container. But at the same time, they share three other namespaces, the UTS, uh, IPC, and NET of the corresponding port. And the owner of the port is the, um, uh, the port uh, container. And this could be, uh, could be seen easily. If we call uh, CRICTL inspect and, uh, uh, and supply their the pod ID. Inspect P. No. It's, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So here is the pod uh, uh, from the inside with all its details, including capabilities, uh, namespaces, and like all these low level details. And uh, we should see it's, um, it's a sandbox container somewhere in this output. Oh, there is just too much stuff. Oh yeah, so here is the PID. And if we now look for this, uh, what was it, 5312? And if we look at this um, PID here, here it goes. It's a post container. And it's an owner of these three um, namespaces. And that gives us an idea how pods are actually constructed from um, containers. On one hand, so this, uh, I think, a useful learning experience to just investigate such things. But on the other hand, it gives us an ability to troubleshoot things when something is wrong with uh, our Kubernetes nodes. So you can just jump on it and start using tools you are already familiar with. You can start from CTR, but if you are not sure, like if you cannot connect the dots, you can uh, fall back to the CRL, CRI CTL. But if you are getting like too desperate, you can always pull in the NERD CTL tool and um, uh, starting like with the heavy stuff with the Docker like uh, UX. So I think that's it for the practical part. And um, the only thing that is left is, um, uh, but I, you probably already. Uh, got an idea why container D is actually used everywhere. And I said it already like multiple times. 
is because of its um, uh, super powerful API and how um, well scoped its uh, responsibilities are. So it's pretty narrow tool, but at the same time, it's a very powerful one uh, because it, it has like all the needed stuff to manage your containers, uh, starting from this um, uh, bundle and root file system management uh, and adding even with the network configuration through the CNI plugins. And the coolest part about Container D is that most of its subsystems are actually pluggable. So if we look at this um, simplified architecture diagram of Container D, we have the storage subsystem and it has this uh, snapshot subsystem, which is a bunch of um, built-in snapshotters and also pluggable snapshotters uh, like um, the storage Z thingy. Uh, same for the images and containers. By the way, you see uh, that's um, another uh, another way to to, to uh, like uh, to differentiate between containers and actual processes. Uh, it uh, this diagram nicely says that images and containers are just metadata, and the actual image contents uh, is handled by the content system a subsystem, and when they are mounted, it becomes a, a snapshot. Um, but uh, what is an image is just its metadata side. And the same is for the container. Like container is just metadata, but when it comes to running containers, it's tasks. Yeah, but all these subsystems, they are pluggable. You can see it again uh, with um, uh, this uh, CTR, um, CTR plugins list command. And you can just... Uh, if you feel the, uh, like, I know, if you are curious enough or you feel a need to uh, augment the functionality of Container D, you can just go there and uh, take a plugin that you want to uh, like re-implement and, and do it. And there is like plenty of documentation. Uh, for instance, what could be pluggable is this um, Container D to the low level runtime integration. You have a shim for that. And uh, I think out of the box, you have um, uh, like two shims available, like V1 and V2, but you can implement a third shim. So these shims are, I think, uh, OCI runtime compatible, but you can have um, a true virtual machine running as a container, not uh, a, an isolated process. So you can go and implement your own shim and start using container D as a manager of containers that are implemented by virtual machines, also doable. And I think uh, that's um, pretty much what um, Container D Firecracker project does or something like that. So they use this controlling capabilities of Container D to control uh, either, uh, other type of isolated boxes, which are Firecracker virtual machines. Uh, and uh, that's what makes Container D uh, really a good choice and a very powerful choice. Yep, that's it for today. Thank you, Ivan. That's a wonderful, wonderful. I think it's been a great journey for me and a great journey for everyone. And I think we have mostly covered all of the questions. But one question I think I see in the chat is from the Kusen. We look at the Lino VM and he tries to compare itself with the WSL. So he's, he thinks about like why is Lino VM is only supports for Mac? Why, why it's not for other, other ways around? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And uh... Who knows? I, I, I'm not uh, familiar with the uh, Lima's roadmap, but maybe they could extend it because right now you can use Lima. I, I think the primary use case is for macOS, but you can also use it on, on Linux. Because Why not? Um, and it's supported, I think. But actually, yeah, it could become a Windows alternative as well. Yes, and one more question I can see from the Kumal Anurag. Can we use build X instead of build kit? So that's a good one. 
so uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Build X is actually a Docker's front-end for BuildKit. So when you uh, build images uh, using Docker Build X commands, uh, it actually uh, goes through uh, BuildKit. Um, but it has like more expressive um, API and more powerful comparing to the uh, like good old Docker build command. And to be honest, I don't know what's the current um, mapping of the NerdCTL tool to this uh, build X flex, let's say. Uh, so I guess technically it's possible, uh, but maybe not just every you know flag is implemented yet so i need to double check yes i think on the topic of build x and this point i think in the in the containers world today we see a lot of conversation around the base images and then we need to extract the base images layer base image information because the doctor docker is hiding the base image layer you can't see what is your image base layer is at and with tools like in the Conico or other tools in the KO in the market, then can extract the information, the base layer. And also you can replace your base images as you see the vulnerabilities in it. But I think that hasn't come out yet, come out yet in the Docker, Docker world. I think Docker has written a blog about how you can extract the information, build information using the build X. But that is actually, I think, missing as of, as of today. Um. Yes, it's definitely missing. I've heard some rumors <laughs> that it might be coming out uh, in some future, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yes, and one more question. Like I think, you, uh, like we 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 see this conversation a lot in the social. Like we have a slimmer images, and we need just the things that our application need. We put not every useful stuff in it. But when we run the container in the production, we need a debugging tools. And when we slim down the version of container images, we have we have we remove this capability of troubleshooting the containers. But in the Kubernetes world right now, I think the ephemeral containers in V.125, that's a good news because you run a container inside your main application and then you troubleshoot that. But let's say if somebody is not in the Kubernetes world, in the Docker world, and he can want to troubleshoot his images, can we see in, in the future, like on the fly, who can add a terminal shell into the base image layer, and then we, when, then we work on it. It's basically not present previously. But when we pull the images, and later down the road, we add a command and terminal is available, and then we add something up. Yes. Um... But uh, I would personally not mess up with the base image of your yes. uh, with the base of your production image. Uh, it's not like it's uh, it's technically wrong or not. It's just like you know personal preferences. But indeed, there is a need to debug um, these uh, slim containers. And yes, in case of Kubernetes, it's being solved by the ephemeral containers. But ephemeral containers, um, uh, these are, uh, they are actually what we, uh, we are playing with today. I've never mentioned ephemeral containers uh, up until this point, but all this um, playing with the uh, container file systems and with container namespaces and trying to run one container in the space of another, uh, this is what constitutes these ephemeral containers. So if you are savvy enough with these tools I showed you today, uh, you can just go directly to wherever your container is running and run another image uh, with all your debugging tools uh, included uh, and sharing some of the namespaces of the containers uh, of, of a container you wanted to debug. And um, um, you would have pretty much a similar experience as with kubectl um, debug command. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And one more, like, I think that's the final question we can read. Can you set up a Kubernetes node using Lima? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, like there are different ways, right? So uh, Lima gives you a virtual machine 
and there is container D running on this virtual machine. And this is a normal Linux virtual machine. So one of the ways you can just SSH to this or like do Lima shell, uh, Lima CTL shell to this machine and then just bring in a mini cube and run this mini cube with container D as a driver for your uh, container, uh, for your Kubernetes control. Uh, I'm talking for too long, sorry. Uh, with your container runtime. And uh, that would give you a Kubernetes cluster um, inside of a Lima machine. But this is something for your experimentation and for your tests, maybe for some very, very ad hoc development. Of course, you wouldn't do this in production. Um, having Lima machine as a worker node for some other Kubernetes control plane well, I guess it's doable with some tinkering, but I'm not sure what would be uh, the benefits of having this uh, versus just having a another technology there. Absolutely, and a lot of the appreciation and a lot of the wonderful messages. I can see one of the messaging saying that Alvin's article helped me getting a paid internship. So his article is wonderful, learning resource for everyone. And everyone is saying, because I enjoyed every bit of it. I see the messages in the chat. It's two hours. It's, it's been a, like a very long time for the people. But everyone enjoyed it. That's a great news for everyone. So it's been a wonderful learning experience. And all the resources are available on the chat. And a one useful resource I could add for the link to the uh, Ivan's blog post as well. So it's been a good go to series. Now closing marks, remarks, Ivan. Um, yeah, like this presentation, if someone needs it and the um, practical uh, part, these are available and uh, I hope uh, Sain will share them uh, in the notes. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, keep tinkering with things. Uh, this is what gives you uh, confidence when you are actually running stuff in production. Um, like going there and reading documentation, in my opinion, it's not enough. It will not give you enough, um, I don't know, insights into a real system. But taking things apart and, and doing things that aren't supposed to be done and just, I don't know, uh, dissecting stuff, that is um, uh, like the way to become really a professional in whatever you are doing being at a, a containers, Kubernetes, uh, just programming, or like you always need to know one or two levels uh, abstraction down your current stack. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And Ivan's newsletter is also the best one. Uh, if, you, if you look at his YouTube uh, Twitter handle, you can subscribe to that as well. And Kusain is saying that the two hours is worth, is a it's a great experience, and that I think has been a wonderful experience for me and everyone. And I hope to have another. You'll uh, we have to try and uh, join again another session with Ivan, either on Docker Slam or other things. And that's a, thank you very much, Ivan. It's been a wonderful experience. We have learned how to write a container D from scratch. We look at it, and we look all of the things as well. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Ivan, for sharing your time, precious time with us. Hope to see you again in another live stream. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks, thanks for having me. And have a great whatever you.